how does the annual gift tax exclusion fit into broader, you know, estate planning tax strategies? Part of it is the government wants their money. <laughs> they want their tax money. What people used to do back in the day was they'd give their money to their children who were in a lower tax bracket, that income would be taxed to the children at the lower bracket. The gift tax was meant to prevent people from doing that. If you earned it, you get taxed on it at your tax bracket. There's an annual exclusion per person. It's like 17,500 right now. If you have a married couple, of course, that doubles. My extremely bad math suggests that's $35,000, but you should check. So you can give away a certain amount of not just money per se, it doesn't have to be cash, but value of something hmm. every year. Welcome to the Will and the Way podcast, a podcast about making estate planning simple and accessible with fun stories, delightful soapbox rants, and more educational resources than you can imagine. Each week, we deliver the best insights and practical advice on wills, trusts, and how to protect what's important to you. Now, here's your host, Attorney Alexandra Jackson. Welcome to A Will and A Way, where we talk every week about estate planning topics. This week, we are talking about taxes. All right. And specifically, what you can do with an estate plan to, to plan for taxes, because much like the root cause of estate planning itself, taxes are also a certainty. I guess to start with, could you provide sort of an overview of what estate tax planning entails? and why it's so important to estate planning overall. So like with anything else, you wanna know what the consequences are, right? You've gotta know what do you need to file? Who do I need to pay? It looks really ugly <laughs> if you owe the IRS money. I don't recommend it. My dad, in fact, once said that you can owe anybody money except the government. So take that very seriously. The whole point of doing tax planning when you're doing estate planning is generally you wanna minimize the tax. There's some fairly obvious and sometimes fairly stupid things that people do, which can incur a lot of extra tax for no good reason. We're obviously trying to avoid those. You also want to keep in mind the various federal, state, estate, and inheritance taxes because you really need to know how you're impacting the beneficiary. You know, if there's a really large inheritance tax or some other effect, that might not be a good thing you're giving them actually was working with somebody once as a local rep for a different attorney and the issue was the woman was trying to disclaim an inheritance because mm. she lived in Germany and the taxes were going to be so absurd that it was better that she just never get the money at all. And that's one of those things that you should sort of think of ahead of time because wow. now they got to figure out where the money's going. But that's the sort of thing you don't want to do to a family member. You don't want to be like, congrats, you're going to pay so much of this in taxes that you don't even want to look at it or deal with it at all. Good luck. Yikes. So that's why you want to think about that ahead of time. No kidding. So <laughs> There's also sometimes tax benefits for specific people. So, you know, a surviving spouse on a retirement account, for example, gets a better deal than a random other person. Charities also may benefit more from certain types of assets than a real human person would. Oh, fascinating. See, that I, that's why I love doing this podcast with you because, you know, my background is not in estate planning law, so I actually get to learn. And I'm reasonably certain I'm mortal, so this will all be <laughs> useful at some point. Well, if you're not, let me know. I got a business proposition for you. Yeah. So you mentioned the federal estate tax. So how has the federal estate tax exemption changed over the years? And are the implications for, you know, individuals, families? So mostly that's just gone up and up and up, I'll be honest with you. For example, it was at $5 million. Maine changed their own estate tax to match it, I think in part because they recognized that times were changing property ownership-wise, and in part because it was much more practical. <laughs> you didn't have to keep track of two. But right now it's $11.6 million plus adjustment for inflation per person. So the av yeah, it, it's funny money at this point. Gotcha. The average person is not going to touch it. So it's something to be aware of. And here's a couple of reasons. So it sounds very funny when we say that. But you have to bear in mind that for couples 
if one of you dies, it ends up concentrated on the other person. Mm. Now again, 11.6, you know, pretty up there. I'm in Maine's the clear. 5 million, pretty up there. Some states don't have it at all, but Massachusetts was a million last that I was looking at it. And if you own a home in Massachusetts, you've probably got more than a million dollars of value. So you got to be careful about that sort of stuff. Um, the federal government, though, most folks don't have to worry about. Certainly in Maine and in states with no estate tax whatsoever, mm -hmm. you don't have to worry as much. But you got to watch out for all your local rules. You could hit one that's low compared to the property values. And then suddenly the one house has you over and there's no money to pay because mm. it's all in the real estate. Right. You get no liquidity, no cash. The other nasty one from my perspective mm -hmm. is inheritance taxes. So the estate tax is based on what you own to death. Mm -hmm. The inheritance tax is on the person receiving it. Mm. So Pennsylvania, for example, has an inheritance tax. Maine does not. So there are certain things where you just get penalized for getting money. It's like the person in Germany, you know, you, it may not be a great thing you're doing for them, depending on how you give it. Different uh, types of property uh, and different ways of owning things can make that easier. Now, I'm going to go off script a little bit and ask a clarifying Always. question about that inheritance tax. Now, is that only on the probate estate or is, is there a way around that in terms of, you know? So the estate tax will generally include what's called an expanded estate. Mm -hmm. So not merely things passing through probate. Inheritance tax, since I don't deal with it, I have no idea, but entirely possible. Okay. So do we have an inheritance tax here in Maine? No. Oh, phew. <laughs> okay. No, there's no state-specific inheritance tax that you got to worry about. All right. All right. They figure you're over $5 million, they're going to get their money anyway. <laughs> they don't have to tax it at both ends. And so what are the, I guess, the practical implications for estate planning when you're thinking about, you know, there's going to be a tax on the estate itself and then, you know, potentially taxes on the individuals who are inheriting under the estate? You want to look at the way you're giving it to them for the most part and also what type it is. So, for example, if you have ownership of a business, you might want to start gifting shares during lifetime instead of leaving it all to them at death. You know, you do have a certain amount excluded before you hit federal gift tax every year. There's all sorts of ways that you can kind of piecemeal it so that they're not dumped on all at once in a way that's subject to enormous tax. For example, another one is retirement accounts. Mm -hmm. Living people with retirement accounts, 401k, IRA, whatever, can do unlimited Roth conversions per year, which means that they take their pre-tax money and they pay the tax on it. And the trick is the Roth version of the account has no taxes when you take the money out, right? Mm -hmm. So traditional retirement account, the money is not taxed going in, it's taxed coming out. That's why you have required minimum distributions. However, with a Roth, money is taxed going in but not coming out, no required minimum distributions. This does two things. One, you don't have to take minimum distributions and reduce the account, and two, the person receiving the account doesn't have to pay taxes on it. So if you're willing to pay the tax, your kids don't have to. Gotcha. So obviously taxes have to get paid somewhere. And if your kids are in a much lower bracket than you are, then maybe that's not a good deal. Maybe you're spending too much if you do the conversion. But for the most part, retirees are in a lower tax bracket than working kids. Mm. I mean, I say kids, but we're all like, you know, 30s and 40s usually minimum by the time we're getting this sort of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So. All right. Well, and I guess to go into a little more detail, how does the annual gift tax exclusion fit into broader, you know, estate planning tax strategies? So the gift tax is a really weird federal mechanism. It will not shock anybody to know, I think I've been on this soapbox before, but this is all about government convenience, right? Part of it is the government wants their money. <laughs> they want their tax money. What people used to do back in the day was they'd give their money to their children who were in a lower tax bracket, and then that income would be taxed to the children at the lower bracket. Mm -hmm. 
the gift tax was meant to prevent people from doing that. It was, oh no, if you earned it, you get taxed on it at your tax bracket. Mm -hmm. So there's an annual exclusion per person to person, so individual to individual. It's like 17500 right now. It's not like it is, <laughs> but at any rate, if you have a married couple, of course, that doubles. My extremely bad math suggests that's $35,000, but you should check. So you can give away a certain amount of not just money per se. It doesn't have to be cash, but value of something hmm. every year. So, for example, you could give a small amount of shares every year without pushing into God. that value Keep area where you that. actually have to be taxed on it. Okay. The other really fun thing that people can do if you are not concerned that you're surpassing your 11.6 plus million dollars as an individual, is right now you can use, well, not right now, at any point, you can use federal estate tax exemption amounts to avoid paying gift tax. So, in this little monopoly game of legal fictions, what you're doing is, what happens with most of my clients is, they're moving the house into an irrevocable trust mm -hmm. for Medicaid planning. Technically speaking, when you do that, that's a gift. It's a completed gift because the trust and thereby the trust beneficiaries are going to be receiving that. Mm -hmm. They have no more ownership. Mm -hmm. So that's usually with property values what they are, and particularly what they are right now, more than 17500 per individual. If you can find me a, a little house. Bit. A little yeah. bit. <laughs> If you can find me a house for less that's in some place I want to live, let me know. But as a general rule, what you can do is you can say, all right, I'm taking some of my exemption amount. I'm giving it up so that I don't have to pay gift tax. So mm. my $11.6 million is going down to 11.3 because my house in the boonies of Maine is now only worth $300,000. Mm. Sorry, I'm just really mad about property values oh, right I now. I just heard the <laughs> average home value in, in Maine for the last month was like 350000 or something like that. Whew, I'm glad I bought what I did. <laughs> yeah, City of Portland revalued my property and it's already at much more than what I paid for it. So, at any rate, you can do exchanges like that, which are really neat. Mm. Because a lot of my clients are not worried about having... Right. More than $11 million per person at their debt. They don't say. <laughs> yeah, I know. Shocking, right? But they do care a lot about moving this one house, but mm. they do not have the money to pay gift tax. So you can make the swap, which for the average family, neat deal. Yeah, that would make a lot of sense. It, it's all funny money to you guys, right? So <laughs> it's funny money to me. So can you talk a little bit more about, I guess, the benefits of using trust generally and you know, when estate tax planning and specifically a revocable living trust too. So one of the really nice things about revocable living trusts is that since they're kind of passed through entities like an S Corp or an LLC, they get what's called a step up in basis at death. So the reason you care about basis, which most of you never think about, because I never think about it much except for tax class, is when you purchase something, that's usually your basis in it. If you have a a property, like a house, as you add stuff to it that can't be removed. In Maine, fun fact, the carpet is considered something that is removable. So you are legally allowed to take it with you. Do we? No. What kind of absurd person does that? But I digress. However, as you make improvements to the property that cannot be removed and taken with you, your basis goes up. So for example, if you add heat pumps to a home mm -hmm. or you get a new roof or something. I'm not taking the roof with me. It's fully new, but I'm not taking it with me. So your basis goes up. You get an extra bump for it being your primary home because they don't want you to be paying $1,000 in taxes. Well, it's not just 1000 but they don't want you paying an egregious amount in taxes every time you sell your primary residence and buy a new one, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's mean. Mm -hmm. It's just flat mean. But ordinarily... If you've got a property, the difference between what your basis is and what you sold it for is the amount you're taxed on. Obviously, if it's negative, you've got a loss. But if you made any money on it, if you sold in the past three years in Maine, you made a good lot of money on it, that difference is where you get taxed. However, there is what's called a step up in basis at the death of an owner. 
So the basis becomes fair market value on date of death, which means if you, like my father, bought your house in the 1970s for like $38,000 at your right now, assuming he's dead, I'm not going to do that to him. Don't worry, I can't inherit if he dies. Well, if I killed him. Anyway, I digress. But so if he drops dead tomorrow and my mom, because they both own it, I'm getting this, just worse and worse. This, but whatever. This hypo is... <laughs> Woo. I feel bad about killing off other people's family members, so I've got to use mine, right? Uh, but anyway, so if my dad bought it at 38000 and he dies tomorrow and mom dies and it's worth 500000 the new basis is 500000 So if I turned around and sold that house, which I would never ever do because I am so attached to that house, it's not even funny. But if I sold it for like $550,000, I'd only have to pay tax on the $50,000. It's the difference between that basis and that amount I sold it for. So you usually get a step up in basis, which is why it's called that, as opposed to a step down. If the market's bad, you're getting a step down. But for the most part, people end up with a higher basis, so they're taxed less on it. It has sometimes been referred to as the last, you know, true tax haven, basically. But a revocable living trust and some other types of trust, depending on how they're structured, will include that step up in basis, God. which is really lovely, mm. frankly. No, no, no. So we'll change tax a little bit here. And I wanted to ask about the role of charitable giving in estate tax planning and also charitable trusts. Can you talk a little bit about those? Yeah, the, obviously, if you're charitably inclined, that's great. And that's something you should do anyway. However, there's also specific tax benefits. You get a tax break for a certain you know, capped amount of donation to charity. So if you are setting up a trust or really anything, you can use some of that to offset it. If you give some to charity, you can use that tax break basically in order to increase the amount of actual cash or property going to family. Mm -hmm. There's obviously a point at which the math doesn't work out and if you're just charitably inclined, by all means, just give it away. But for most people, they cut a very calculating balance between maximizing out that charitable amount to get the tax break on it. There's also some really interesting ways in which charities can benefit. So I was discussing with a client and her financial planner the other day what her setup was, and she basically wanted to give half of what she had to you know live humans and because I know corporations are people, but let's be real here. And she wanted to give half to charities. Mm -hmm. And so we were looking at how her accounts were kept and her financial advisor, and I certainly agreed with this, suggested that since it was about half in retirement accounts that would be taxable and about half held in other ways, the retirement account should go to the charities because they would not have to pay tax. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you've got, I'm talking funny money again, but if there's $300,000 in a retirement account mm -hmm. and it would have to be taxed at, I don't know, I'm terrible at math, so forgive me, I'm going to use a third. <laughs> but that means that $100,000 is lost, right? Charities don't have to pay that. The charity's going to get 100% of this untaxed money. Mm -hmm. Whereas your real person, first right. of all, unless they meet specific requirements, has to take it all out in 10 years. And two, has to pay taxes on it. So since she had everything about even, we were like, well, the charity can get a tax break from this type of asset. The real humans might as well get this other one mm -hmm. because there's no extra benefit to them in getting the retirement accounts. Gosh. And so we, you know, structured it accordingly for how to divide up and move the assets. Gosh. Um, so I always think of sort of you know, estate planning law is relatively settled, but Mostly. that may, I mean, <laughs> that may be my ignorance speaking, but I guess how do, you know, any recent or anticipated changes in, you know, either tax legislation or, you know, the estate planning laws, how do they influence your, the advice you're giving to your clients? I'd say the really big recent changes have been through the SECURE Acts, both of them. I mentioned earlier that with very limited exceptions, 
you have 10 years to take out the entire amount of a retirement account. That is a, a result of the various Secure Act uh, legislation. There used to be what was called a stretch IRA, which is now only open to spouses and to a very limited number of other beneficiaries. But basically, what would happen is you could name a beneficiary on the account. The beneficiary could then stretch it out over their whole lifetime mm -hmm. at their own ages at which they had to make minimum distributions, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you have 60 years to take out money versus 10 years, you can just leave it growing. Mm -hmm. And so shifting the way people look at retirement account beneficiaries has been certainly a big one. Yeah, I didn't know about that. That is yeah, it was 10 years. The, it wasn't really a, so that was targeted at traditional retirement accounts. The right. issue was if people don't take out the money, the government doesn't get their taxes. Mm -hmm. So if they stretched out over 60 years, instead of paying it in 10, obviously the taxes are going to be wildly different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, with a Roth, it doesn't matter, but they still did it, whatever, not my problem. Oh, so they, it even applies to a Roth IRA? Yeah, any retirement account is still subject mm -hmm. to that. I guess that's just because they wanted to, I don't know. I don't pretend to understand how any of that gets conceived of and done, but it was clearly about the tax break and about taking it out over too long a period of time. But what was the other? Oh, the other big thing that's on the horizon, we talked about that 11.6 plus million, mm. that is set to go away as of January 1, 2026. Mm. So it's dropping back down to a mere 5 million, which means for Maine, it's all gonna be the same, right? Mm -hmm. But there are people we're going to be squished between that. I mean, right. there's some stupid ways that you can run into taxes like that. And it's mostly about real estate. Let's be honest. Mm -hmm. If you own waterfront property in Maine, that's like a million dollars, depending on where it is. Even if you've got this modest little house, because all anybody cares about is the land. So I'm still not as worried about $5 million, But there's certainly people who are going to exist in that gap who are going to get caught. One of the things that people are or should be doing is using up the gift tax, doing the swap, basically. So saying, well, oh. no matter how much of the estate tax exemption I spend, it's going down from 11.6 to 5. Mm -hmm. So I can spend, you know, 6.6 if my math's any good, and I'll still have 5. Oh, even after it goes down? Oh. Correct. Well, then. It's use it or lose it, basically. So if folks are going to be caught in that interim, they might want to just do lifetime gifting instead because it's going away if you use it or not. Hmm. So if you dip below the five, you're still not going to get it back. You know, if you use up enough that you're down to four, they're not going to give you a refresh to five. But the stuff between five and 11.6, and I know it's higher than that now because of the adjustment, but I'm using this number because it's easier. That stuff in between is going away, period. So... Gotcha. If you can, if you need to, you might as well use it. I mean, why not? Like, you know, you know my daughter, Charlotte, she's four years old. Should I be giving her my house? <laughs> no, because she can't legally own anything at that age. But should I create a should I create an LLC that she owns? And uh, give that my house? Brutality. I would probably recommend a trust because I mean, you could do LLCs, of course, also. But generally speaking, a trust is a lot simpler mechanism, depending on what you're trying to move. Mm -hmm. To me, anyway. The reason being, the reporting requirements to maintain the corporate veil mm -hmm. are something that I worry about families committing to fully. Mm -hmm. So, there's no way don't have that. <laughs> there's no way Charlotte's going to sit through a board meeting no, while I take minutes. No, you got to have a yearly board meeting. It's not... This is one of my general things with families. If I don't think that you can commit, and certainly most people will just tell me up front, but if you cannot commit to the level of maintenance, a certain form of estate planning needs, you just shouldn't do it. I think it is worse to create some sort of corporate entity and not mm. maintain it and lose all of its benefits than it is to just do it another way from the start. That's one of those lines you have to walk between yeah, a trust is great. If you're never, ever going to do the paperwork required to put things in the trust, you paid a lot of money for fancy paper. So I don't 
you got to keep it within your threshold of tolerance for paperwork. Right. Well, we're getting to the end of our time today. So I guess I'll finish up with the, the classic question. You know, what is the most crucial piece of advice that you'd like to share with folks tuning in about crafting an effective estate tax plan? The most important part is you need to know what you have and what's going to impact you. And you need to know what's going to impact your beneficiaries. So we talked earlier about you know people living out of country or in states that have mm-hmm. crazy tax brackets and it's not gonna make a lot of sense for them to get something. Mm-hmm. This is the sort of discussion you should have with people ahead of time or think about ahead of time. Be like, okay, well, you know, if the charity doesn't have to pay the taxes, the charity should get the retirement account. And just bear in mind that there are things that will happen regardless of whether or not you think about them. Mm. So it's better to think about them ahead of time and try and match reality when you are making your plan than it is to let somebody else just try and clean it up. All right. Well, that's been another outstanding episode of, I I almost said Victor over VA, (laughs) but a will and a way. Yep. Maine's premier estate planning podcast. Please subscribe and be sure to tune in next week. See you then. Thanks for joining us this week on the Will and the Way podcast. Make sure to visit our website, jacksonestateplanning.com slash podcast, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Spotify, or via RSS so you'll never miss a show. Be sure to tune in next week for our next episode.